Hello everyone and welcome to the Paradox Podcast, a podcast about the business of video games with me, Daniel Goldberg, and you, Shams Giorgiani. Yay! We are <laughs> coming to you live and direct <laughs> from the Paradox office in Stockholm and there's uh, there's literally no one here except for us. Summer, summer break. Should we explain what July looks like for uh, for those that are not from Sweden? Yes, we should explain what, what July is like in, in Sweden. So, uh, first off, you got to understand that from November to April, it's terrible weather and it's very dark. It's dark and rainy and cold. So when summer rolls around, everyone's just delirious with uh, happiness. So we actually have in our, you know, I don't know if it's in the constitution, but at least it's law. No, it's not in the constitution. No. <laughs> but it's law that yeah. if somebody wants to go yeah. take their, you know, four, uh, any employer cannot deny anyone who wants to take like three or four consecutive weeks yeah. of vacation during July. Oh really? During yeah. July? Yeah, I during July. It's yeah. industry semester. Yeah. It's called Indus yeah. industrial, industrial vacation. vacation. Yeah. yeah, and in practice, then most of Sweden shuts down in July. Yeah, and w when we say shuts down, you kind of mean like, ha ha, everyone's away away for two weeks. Yeah. No, no, it's empty. It, it's everything stops. Literally empty, and it's it's people usually extend. We get six weeks of vacation per year. I'm doing promotion for coming to work in Sweden now. Yeah, uh, and people have maternity and paternity weeks, and mostly from like middle of June until the middle of august people are away isn't it five weeks we no six six it's we have an extra week for us right yes we have an extra week at paradise we have, an extra we week have six too. weeks yeah yeah so you know the, the country is basically at a standstill uh no one's around to answer emails no one's around to really make any decisions uh not much happens really yeah and that it sounds uh, great. It, it sounds great. It's it's not as big of a problem. Once you get used to it, it's not as big of a problem as you'd think. I mean, most people sort of get get you get used to you know July. Not much will happen. So if you're working during that period of time, it's actually really nice because you get a lot of time to get yeah. you know think about long term stuff. All of the th all of the things you will you never find time to get done with people in the office and lots of yeah. other stuff happening you actually find the time to do that during summer times so. i'd say there's one exception and that's for people like me who mostly actually don't work with the people in the office but yeah. work with people in the u.s yeah, yeah, and exactly. other countries yeah, for that... partners it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hassle for, <laughs> because for... they're like why are you guys away we're yeah. doing business <laughs> why is no one here exactly. Yeah, exactly so for everyone who's not here and everyone who has a relationship with anyone outside of the paradox office, but it's also dependent on someone here to get stuff done. Yep. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a hassle. A bit of a hassle. But anyway, the podcast prevails. the The podcast never goes on holiday. Uh, we. What are we talking about today? We're talking about uh, licensing. Licensing. What is it? Why do we do it? Uh, why how, is it? How do we do it? Why is it much more exciting than it might uh, seem? Or sound. Or sound. But before we do that, uh, let's do the usual. Thing. Yeah. What have you been playing? I've been playing Hitman too. Oh wow, that's a that's unexpected. Yes, I, I picked it up uh, during the Steam Summer Sale, which is now ended. Yeah. Um, but this is not the the original Hitman two. No, no, this, this is, is the new, new Hitman, Hitman two. Yeah. Uh, and it, believe it or not, it's my first uh, Hitman yeah. uh, game, and oh, it's wow. I've been enjoying it quite a bit. Uh, but it's not quite what I am envisioned it to be. Uh, it's just this. I think the tagline for the um, the game is "Make the world your weapon," mm -hmm. and that is more or less what the game is. It's just a kind of a living sandbox, yeah. and then you kind of do weirdo shit. So the it, I play it like I play Crusader Kings. I just oh. set up arbitrary goals for myself rather yeah. than trying to achieve the most efficient kill. Yeah. Like, could I do this weird shit and just seeing how the world reacts. Yeah. So it's been having a bit of fun with that. Uh, and I'm probably not going to play it for a lot more, but mm -hmm. I've been having a good amount of fun for the last 20 hours. Yeah. I love the Hitman games. I actually played the original Hitman too. Oh, wow. Like crazy. I really enjoy that game. It's uh, uh, these very elaborate uh, skills and very elaborate sort of machines or cause and effect type things that yeah. you can get going are yeah. super fascinating. Were they uh, less, uh, more more railed? Back in the days, it was like you have to kill them by toppling the statue, or, or you know. No, I haven't played the new ones that much, so I don't really okay. know. They're very open ended. I mean, okay. the objective is always quite clear. You know, you have to kill this person. Yeah. And there might be restrictions on that, mm -hmm. as in, you know, you, no one can hear you, no one can see you, stuff like that. Um, but it's very open on how you approach it. Yeah. And I mean, that's the fun, right? Like, you, can you make, in order to really, you know, 
nail a perfect kill, yeah. you need to be quite elaborate and you really need to take a lot of things into account. Like, sure. You know, how are the guards moving yeah. and you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, so. Yeah. so what have you been playing? I'm back on the Magic Arena train. Oh. <laughs> so a new expansions or a new core set has just come out. So no more Games Pass stuff? You uh, you I haven't actually Pass? touched Game Pass. <laughs> Since <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to be asking Magic this every time now to uh, see if you come back to it. Since Magic 2020 uh, was released, yeah. but the interesting thing is that I haven't really been browsing Steam either. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, right? Okay. Because I'm, you know, whenever I think maybe I should play something else, the the thing that immediately springs to mind is like, let's see if there's anything new on Game Pass on my Xbox. Okay. Do you, just I, as uh, you know, since I since I started using Netflix, I don't really buy films off of iTunes no. anymore. Okay, so you used to buy films. No, but it's it's, very a, it's, yeah, it's just an, it's a hypothetical example. <laughs> we never really had iTunes in that way in Sweden, but you know, to go to the cinema or whatever. So let me ask you this question because you, you raised something interesting. I stopped using Steam as a browsing storefront yeah. uh, about two years ago when they really started to uh, yeah. open the floodgates. Uh, do you, I now find myself using Twitch to oh, check interesting. what's yeah. happening? Yeah rather yeah. than like what now, am i in the mood for and i click around yeah my um, i would say maybe i um, i use twitch more to see what's happening in the world not necessarily to give me inspiration on what to play that much mm. i i actually use i would say i probably use steam and uh you know uh you know, you know the general media outlets that i check f for that okay. to, to find out what i should be trying in twitter and what have you um but to your point I, I use the Steam front page. Yeah. I use the you know the featured spots on Steam. That's what's telling me you know what's on sale, what's new, what's being highlighted. Yeah. And that's that's kind of I think speaks to the power of those uh, you know those content slots, as it were. Yeah. And we can see that very clearly when we track our marketing as well. There's really there are very few things that we can do that have the same impact as a feature or. Uh, you know, an IM push on Steam. It's yeah. just extraordinary the number of eyeballs and the number of the number of people you reach who are kind of in the mood to play something with that. It's just such a, a huge spike on pretty much every metric as soon as we do something, as soon as Steam yeah. helps us with visibility. I sense, think right? I think this is going to be interesting as m the streaming stuff picks up. One of the yeah. one of the main USPs of the uh, Google push mm -hmm. is that the connection to YouTube. Yeah. I don't know if I'm breaking NDA here. We can cut this out if I am. I don't think you are. I think um, this is all where you yeah. can just simply watch a YouTube video of any game. Yeah. And if it's enabled with stream. With Theoretically, a you just click one click and then you one play click, it, jump straight in. They talked about jumping into that actual game yeah. state yeah. versus even you know, just starting yeah. up the game. Um, then the question is that if uh, how behavior patterns change. Yeah. If, if more people are doing what I'm doing, looking at a video and then making a decision yeah. rather than yeah. browsing. Yeah. Having said that, though, I agree with you in theory. Uh, Twitch tried the same thing with their storefront. Yeah, didn't really work that well. No, it right? Because people just checked out what was playing on Twitch and then they went to Steam and bought it there. So it's <laughs> yeah, but that's what happened, yeah. right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of intricacies to this. But I think um, you know, oh, it's pretty basic, really. But just owning the the place where people go to see what you know, whenever pe someone's in the mood, I want to play something. What should I play? owning that place where that decision is that made is obviously super I valuable. I know. But I, I think, and I've said this a hundred times before, I think it's going to be different in three three years' time. Oh, yeah. Because Steam has been the um, modus operandi for every PC gamer for the past oh. 10 years. Yeah. But now everyone has five different accounts and, you know, Origin is not as bad as it used to and be. I th and, you know. and I think to make it even more complex, this speaks to one of our big... Uh, challenges or opportunities uh, on the marketing side in the year ahead, I think, where we come from a place where we've been very much a PC publisher at heart, right? That's been our core, that's been where our focus is. But f going forward, simship across PC and console is really the standard for us. Yep. And that means that, you know, figuring out what the the Steam equivalent is on console, and not just knowing what it is, but also building the relationships and building the understanding and building the knowledge of how it works to achieve the same thing on PlayStation or Xbox is something that we really need to work on. Yeah. How do we get in front of, and how do we, you know, how do we get in touch with the console players at that right moment? We're very good at this on PC. We're not very good at it on console. So that's a huge thing that we need to sort of work on and there's a huge opportunity for us to capture in the year ahead of especially us. exciting as we're moving into a new console generation as well. yeah exactly yeah yeah anyway 
that's that. That's that. Yeah. So Magic is still still my favorite game. You're playing Hitman. That's good. Let's uh, move on to talk about licensing. So Shams, in your role as Chief Business Development Officer, <laughs> yes. Paradox, one of the things you manage is our uh, licensing operation. Yep. Um, do you want to share a little bit about what that is and why it exists? Yeah. Um, so I manage uh, a team uh, led by Magnus uh, LaSalle uh, at Paradox, uh, who manages who a number of people who could run... probably have been here if he wasn't on holiday. Yeah, he's on there a long go. extended holiday. Yeah. Good for you, Magnus. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And he manages a team of uh, business developers that yeah. handles licensing. So why do we do licensing where we didn't really do licensing three years ago? Well, first off, there's actual interest in external parties coming to us and saying, hey, you have a couple of cool brands, IPs. Could we license one of these from you? Because we want to make something. So that's one part of it. And licensing, we should can kind of just define it. It's us giving away the rights for our intellectual property for somebody else to use yeah. uh, in a limited fashion. Uh, it really started with the acquisition of White Wolf three mm -hmm. years ago, three and a half years ago, where there were, unlike um, European Resolves and, and Crusader Kings, there were a number of uh, brands that had very wide recognition. Yeah. And even to the point where Vampire and, uh, is, a, a, is a lifestyle brand. Mm -hmm. People live the lifestyle of the brand rather than just enjoying the products. Um, and also, we bought something where there was an existing licensing uh, operation business. in place, right? Because because white or you know the world of darkness catalog of brands has always yeah. functioned in that way. You know, not everything has been made by the actual world of darkness team, no. but rather by license source or license C's. licensees yeah. uh, in, in other places, yes. right? So, uh, so over the course of the past two years, I think Magnus and I have started this up in earnest, yeah. and we've set a kind of process in place because we're we're not licensing experts. Licensing is not Paradox business, nor will it be Paradox business. Yeah. But we got to the point where we realized that hey, if we spend a little bit of time in this, we can actually achieve a number of things that are valuable to us. Mm -hmm. So these things, and also happen to be our KPIs. Um, that's key performance indicators for the new mm -hmm. listeners. Nickel tall in Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> Nickel tall in Swedish. Uh, this is how we're measured. Uh, the most important thing is that licensing is a good way to generate revenue with fairly low effort because you're essentially doing the upfront uh, work of giving the license to somebody, then they're building a product, mm -hmm. they're selling it, they're marketing it, and then you can idly sit by and collect a check yeah. every uh quarter there's a sliding scale to that though we yes. can we can maybe get into that a bit later but yeah, yeah. that's generally how it yeah. works and that's the upside of licensing you know you do the the brand or the ip does the work for you yeah. uh, instead of you doing it the second uh, thing is that we're adding value to the paradox ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of fans who want to engage with uh, play crusader kings and they would like and crusader kings is a, is a, is a fun IP, you could do a lot of fun stuff with it, right? Um, but we, we as a business, your teams, you know, the Julien's teams or the product teams, they'll never make a board game mm -hmm. because that's not our core business. Mm. But there is a opening for a Crusader Kings type board game in the market and board gamers and Crusader Kings players, they have the, their Venn diagrams overlap quite mm. a bit to talk about business speak. Mm. So we were approached by a partner, Freya Ligan, who said that we have a great idea for a Crusader Kings board game. Would you like to do it? We vetted that project, that suggestion. We added uh, feedback. And then they went about raising money via a Kickstarter campaign, then designed and made a game that we signed off on the different milestones. And they released it. They marketed it. Uh, it was sent out to Kickstarter backers two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I have my copy at home. And now it's going to be in retail stores in August 1st or yeah. at Gen Con, I believe. Yeah. That's right. uh, so that's an example of uh, how we'd, yeah. we'd add products to the ecosystem. Yeah. And it's not just about selling more stuff to people who play the Crusader Kings video game. No. It's also... Uh, there's a lot of value in just raising awareness of the brand as such, right? Because, and this this might be, this is not the perfect example because the board game, uh, the tabletop space is obviously quite small compared to the video game space. Yeah. But the general thinking is that we're reaching new audiences, we're reaching new people, and we're making them aware of these brands and hopefully also attracting some, you know, increased interest to our core business, which would be the games by by doing things like this. Yeah. And I think that thinking might be more applicable to something like, you know, a like TV show, for a TV show, for example, yeah. or, you know, possibly books or, poly yeah. theory, you know, 
maybe comics, things like that, right? Ideally, you want to get out to a big thriving market exactly. that has a potential overlap yeah. uh, with the stuff that you're doing. Yeah. I think that, uh, as coming back to Crusader Kings, let's not, you know, joke or, you know, let's be frank about the reason why, a big reason why Crusader Kings is successful is that timing-wise, Game of Thrones came out yeah. roughly the same time. Yeah. And the power fantasy of Crusader Kings happens to be almost the same as in uh, Game of Thrones, which is politics at a very high yeah. level being the head of a house uh so the uh, adding more products to the ecosystem mm. that's a cool thing uh, a third one is exactly what you mentioned uh, which is getting new audiences to notice our brands and the fourth one is actually brand building mm -hmm. essentially uh, we can tell a certain type of stories in a Crusader Kings type game. Uh, a board game can tell different types of stories. They can create other memes, uh, aspects, and you know, actual named characters that might have adventures and stories and stuff like that. Um, I would like us to do our own kind of hornblower take yeah. on Europe and Versailles, for instance. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. And that's something that we consistently lack in the grand strategy uh, yeah. brands. We don't have characters. They're barely brands. Exactly. Aspects. So, so uh, a, a very cl good, clear example, as you've mentioned, of, of us doing this is the board games that we announced uh, last year and yeah. that are now actually coming to market. That's, yeah. that's a clear, clear uh, step in this direction and a very uh, tangible yeah. uh, result of the work of your team, I think. Um, you, you mentioned the sort of general thinking here is that someone else does the work, right? Yeah. Like we give someone, someone asks us, can we use this brand for this product? And yeah. we say yes, and they do everything else. Yes. But it's, 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 it is a sliding scale, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of, you know, the, the, how much we contribute to something like that. Yeah. Uh, can differ depending on what the deal is. Yes. Because obviously the fact that we have access to, uh, you know, a lot of expertise on what defines a certain brand, um, a lot of design expertise in-house, a lot of, uh, you know, a, 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 an audience that we have a direct connection with on the marketing side, skills, you know, whether it's producing creative for, a, uh, for marketing campaigns or advertising or what have you, um, those things can also be part of these deals, right? Yes. So depending on who the licensee is, yes. we might bring other things to the table as well. Absolutely. And so the way we've sliced um, and kind of structured the licensing business is that we have a number of segments. We have video games, yeah. we have tabletops, so mm -hmm. board games and card games and stuff like that. Uh, we have events, uh, we have TV, movie, uh, we have publishing. Yeah. Um, and I'm forgetting something. Anyway, so we have a number of, I think it's about set, seven segments. And uh, a role-playing game, sorry, is another one. And role-playing games is, for instance, what we just uh, did the other day is that we've partnered with Modifius, yeah. our great partners in the UK, who make a lot of cool role-playing games. And this is part of the kind of process with White Wolf. When I kind of stepped in in September of last year, we said that, hey, we're going to focus internally on brand management, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna move the licensing functions to the licensing team at Paradox. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna give people who are really good, much better than we are, at building actual physical products and different, these seven segments, yeah. to those folks instead of us doing them in-house, because yeah. we then have to learn that. So Modifius is handling uh, Vampire 5th Edition, and all the products that come therein, yeah. uh, so to say. Uh, but making a role-playing game requires a lot of guidance and help from the brand side. Yeah. How does the Ravnos clan behave? Why uh, are La Sombra this way or not? Uh, these kind of questions we provide guidance on. So we have a brand management function yeah. for the White Wolf brands yeah. uh, that we provide. So that's, so when we came back to like, is it low effort to make a lot of money? Well, in some cases it is. And in other cases, we expend a lot of energy, but all that brand building and guidelines that are created are actually then also used by the Bloodlines team exactly. or the other, we have, um, uh, there are other vampire games that have been licensed out to Big Ben, for instance, yeah. to do yeah. uh, cool stuff there. So the way we see, because we obviously, uh, World of Darkness is a good example of, 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 a, of a catalog of brands where we see a lot of potential. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we really think that this can be one of the, you know, uh, one of the big modern horror brands yes. uh, in in the world, right? Yeah. And the the thinking is that the best way for us to to actually get to that point is for us to f focus on the the vision and the the direction of this world, and then uh, work with as many uh, talented and 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 brilliant partners as possible 
to have them do what they do best, whether that's a role playing game or a, or a, a you know a tabletop game or yeah. a video game for for that matter. Yeah. And you know, together with them, really build this ecosystem and build this world of of stuff yeah. around the world of darkness, right? Yeah, because ultimately, we've been very clear on what paradox strategy is for the next yeah. seven years. We want to be the top, you know, developer and publisher of these niche type strategy management and RPG games, yeah. right? But you could do tons of cool action games mm. for all of our brands. Yeah. Should we then? And you have to remember that at the end of the day, we're a bunch of nerds over here sitting very frustrated that EA isn't using the Star Wars license to make TIE Fighter mm. remakes. Right? So I put myself in somebody else's shoes and ask myself, people are pretty frustrated that we're not making X, Y, or Z because Paradox Business is very narrow and focused. Yeah. So how about we enable that and make the community happier and, and um in that respect. Well, it's opportunity cost, right? It's yes, like and that's why we don't do pa it. Yeah. Paradox, is, Paradox as, a, as a publisher is good at a very particular thing. Yeah. And, you know, our thinking is that let's let's focus on that and let's find other people who are good at other things and have them yeah. do that uh, in order to build value for us. An <clears throat> action game uh, is, a, is a really good example of that. And this is, uh, we're very new at this and we fully, freely admit this. And it is, for many companies, this ends up being a distraction. Yeah. And we, I talked to Supercell. Yeah. They kind of tone down their oh, efforts in this yeah. this area. They're a very small, niche-focused company. They don't have a ton of employees. Mm -hmm. And everyone's very heavily involved in the development of the games and the, the brands and stuff yeah. like that. So whenever it comes to merchandising or licensing, it ends up being a, quite of a big of a distraction yeah. for them. Uh, but we're getting to the point now where these functions are needed regardless. Mm -hmm. And we think that we can get a kind of a leverage effect by yeah. actually having licensing yeah. on it. But then again, there are different strategies to pursue. Yeah. If you look at a company like Games Workshop, who have their core business, but their licensing has been thriving a lot. So for us, I have a very hard time seeing that licensing will be anything more than a couple of percent of our annual revenue. If you look at the licensing revenue that Activision or Ubisoft or uh, these other major companies have, it's net, well, they're very seldomly more than a couple of percent. And Activision has a world-class brand, right? Yeah. Um, but, but the point isn't necessarily that though, right? The point is, as we talked about in the beginning, is enabling other things. Yes. And you know, using the uh, you know the additional brand value or brand awareness that is created through licensing to really drive your core business. Yes. Uh, but this is where the Games Workshop analogy becomes interesting. Exactly. That they've had a very, you know, I don't know familiar how familiar you are with the type of licensing that they've done. No, the please, please, please share. <laughs> so, um, uh, and we look at them very closely because it's a it's an interesting learning experience. And I think that mentality, and we're quite divided internally if their strategy has been rock solid mm. or wishy washy. Mm. Because for for a while they were very selective in their licensing, yeah. And then they went very wide, and it felt like there was a Space Marine game coming out every other exactly. week. Exactly. Um, but what I've mentioned in the past is that this industry tends to forget mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And while a lot of the Games Workshop games licensed may perhaps weren't the most amazing ones, at the end of the day, if you look back 10 years, people tend to rem remember the biggest successes. It's the Vermin Tides, it's the Total War Warhammers, yep. it's the Space Marines, it's Dawn of Wars. Uh, while the other dozens that probably did fine and filled niches within their portfolio um, did quite well. So that's, that's different strategies. Yeah. I don't think we're going out and saying, hey, let's find 20 licensees that want to take on Crusader Kings. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably not the right approach for us because we've we started to figure out how to handle brand management for some of our core IPs. Yeah. But we're learning as we're going along and yeah. it's... Um, we have a number of games coming out. A kind of a surprise hit uh, during PDXCon last year was the amount of board games and the interest around yep. them, which validated this kind of thinking. Yep. Uh, so for PDXCon this year, we hope to kind of continue that and do even more yep. and have people actually have hands-on experiences with prototypes um, and uh, games that are going to come out or are about to come out or even have come out and see if, hey, maybe my primary love for Crusader Kings is not via the video game. It yeah. might actually be the board game. Yeah. So what's the uh, what's the vision, would you say? What's the what's the sort of end uh, end goal here? What's the big um, the big thing that we're all uh, that you, you you know you you see as the what's the word the big I was going to say golden carrot. That's not the right <laughs> word golden carrot, in the next few years here. <clears throat> no, I think absolutely it would be to have a huge success mm -hmm. via licensing. So mm -hmm. something that is released elsewhere just grows exponentially and becomes a huge hit. Yeah. Uh, I think that the world of darkness 
uh, IPs are ripe for you know something in the TV or movie space. Yeah, I think that we I think we've been fairly clear with this is that we think that that's one of our ambitions to get something in in moving picture form. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, but in the video game side, I, I, I would love, you know, for each segment, we have a number of, you know, big hit uh, targets in the publishing segment a, a cool comic mm -hmm. or a, a no number of novels would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, tabletop have a well-renowned uh, uh, um, board game in the RPG space. We feel we're doing f fairly well with V5 yeah. uh, winning prizes, yeah. selling out in North America. It's doing quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of targets. I don't know. Do you have any from the outside? Do you have any kind of particular? Yeah. No, I think yeah, the, the, this is just me, my own personal interest speaking. But I think uh, uh, some kind of film or TV adaptation of one of the World of Darkness properties would just be amazing. Right? Yeah. It's just it's just a perfect perfect match, and we've really seen the the film industry open up to these, you know niche quite nerdy brands yeah. over the past i don't know 10 10 years or so yeah and the world of darkness is just such a uh, such an opportunity for that if you can get it right i yeah. think that's important it is it, it does require you know it's it's very easy for ho hollywood <laughs> within yeah. quotation marks to really get these things wrong yeah but but getting it right with the world of darkness could just be could be amazing yeah i, I honestly think that that catalog has it's it's not it's not Marvel, but it has the sort of the, the potential of one of these really big uh, pop cultural, uh, really iconic um, universes, you know. And yeah. you know, if we play our cards right, and if we find the right people to play play with, <laughs> yeah, I, I really think we can get there at some point. Yeah. So, but we'll definitely be coming back to licensing as a thing yeah. I, as we announce more uh, stuff. Yeah. And talk about what is the impact. We yeah. should have somebody from the brand management team. And since you are assuming responsibility for yeah. the brand management function, yeah. I would be very interested to hear and share with the audience what the vision is there yeah. in terms Absolutely. of for our brand. Yeah. Yes, that's a good idea. So maybe that's something we can come back to after the summer holidays. The summer holidays, yes. <laughs> when we've all had some time to 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 think about these things. But yeah, because the, it's very much a, a hand in hand process, right? So yeah. Where the, these functions are intended to complement each other. Good stuff. I think before we wrap up, I think we should maybe spend uh, a couple of minutes on uh, discussing the uh, the social media crusades that our illustrious. Uh, uh, Commander in Chief, <laughs> Chairman of the Board, Fred Chairman Wester, went on uh, the other Chairman week. Chairman Wester. Chairman Wester. So, for those of you who do not follow us uh, as closely as you and me do, obviously, Shams, uh, Fred, <laughs> our, our 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 great great leader, <laughs> uh, largest shareholder, uh, ex CEO, and now Chairman of the Board, uh, spent some time uh, on his summer break. Uh, voicing his opinions on uh, in particular the uh, the rev share model between uh, digital distributors like steam and the epic store and publishers like ourselves uh, and also uh, shared a bit of, of thinking on on our chosen business model with dlc and what have you and i don't think we should we don't necessarily need to get into the you know the the, the the views expressed as such even though i don't you know it's nothing it's nothing really that is dramatic about dramatic it. and nothing really that is different from what we've said before but i think w one of the things that i'm getting a lot of questions on is how come <laughs> we have a chairman of the board who is so vocal uh externally on social media uh and and you know gets into <laughs> really these arguments on, Spats. yeah with with sort of just just anyone who's there uh, on social media wh wh you know why how is that to deal with how is that possible <laughs> you know i'm getting comments like oh this must be a lot of work for your pr team yeah uh, and it, it's kind of there's this sense that this is this is not uh this is not desirable and this is not good yeah. and i think it's important to point out that it it is really good. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's and yes, it does create. Yes, Fred, you are creating a lot of work for yeah. for, He's not for Jesse to and this. the PR team. But but you know we we all know that, yeah. right? But I think it's it's imp one of the things that I that we quite often harp on about is is this idea of of transparency yeah. that that we as a company we subscribe to very very strongly. I genuinely believe that one of the key components in our success as a company over the past I don't know 10, 10 years fifteen years is the fact that we 
we are not afraid to and we really like to engage in in conversation with uh you know our players mm. our our fans our customers our partners what have you very transparently and very openly and that goes for every level of the company whether you're yeah. you know the chairman and the largest shareholder you're yourself you're me you're mm. someone in one of the teams you're one of the game designers or game developers we genuinely believe that that this openness and 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 being able to talk to us and us talking to everyone else on every yeah. level is a good thing and it's a yeah. it's a strength in yeah, our exactly. It would have been a problem on BS if if what was being said yeah. wasn't aligning with what was being done or said by others. Exactly. But the fact that it's then being said is the symptom, not the cause, right? Yeah. The cause is that we're not aligned in, in our thinking and our strategy. Mm. The fact that someone says it externally is not in itself a problem. No. In fact, it's a good sanity check, right? Uh Speaking openly about these things, whether you're Fred Wester or you're, you know, uh, a PR person or whatever, helps us all uh, checks the fact that are we aligned here? Yeah. Are we, you know, are we thinking about these things in the same way? And I also know that Fred, before he tweets these things, he checks with us. That the, yeah, of course he does. Uh, it not always, but <laughs> not always, but a lot of the stuff is actually yeah. it is it is the I don't want to say it's a mouthpiece, but yeah. it's definitely. But this is this is really one of those things that I I, I believe very strongly in, and I, I really think that. So Paradox has grown a lot in the past few years, uh, really a lot, right? Mm. In terms of the number of games we work on, but also the number of people in the company. And it's so easy then to fall into, and I think I really think this is a trap of really exerting, a, l attempting to exert a lot of control over how you express yourself as a company externally uh, and just clamping down and just adding all of these, you know, layers of approval before anyone can voice any kind of opinion whether it's like on the internal slack channels or it's on twitter or it's on our forums or what have you and i really want us to be careful there and i really think that of course you know there will always be bureaucracy with growth right but the the more we can keep this spirit of really encouraging openness I think the better for us as a company, yeah. Because it, it also holds holds us accountable towards the people who really matter, which is the people who play our games, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. No, I think uh, I got a tweet from Alexander Slowinski during this the yeah. Twitter tirade. So he says, "Are you and Fred on some sort of dare? <laughs> Blink once for yes, twice for no." <laughs> and I I got a lot of tweets from people like, yeah. "Is everything okay? What's yeah. happening?" I'm like, "This is this is exactly how we operate. Yeah, this, this is, is how it should be." Right? There's no drama on our side. Yeah, we just yeah. follow along and just nod along because we're having the same conversations on all all parts of the company. Yeah, but I, and I also think it's quite empowering, right? Because it's you know, again, with a big company, someone like the chairman of the board can easily become this like mysterious presence, and no one really knows what they think or what they want, but. Here it's quite clear, right? No, if you go back over the years, look at when whenever Fred's participated in panels. Yeah. One of the most uh, well liked panels uh, was when he talked about carving out a niche with an axe. Right. And that got a lot of uh, awareness, but it helped our business tremendously because it allowed us to be very clear about what our priorities and focuses were. Mm. We were a niche company. Mm. We're doing niche products, and. You know, this repeats a lot of the sentiment that we've repeated here. Yep. We always challenge status quo. We talk about the underlying rationale for why things yep. are the way they are. Yep. And we don't just blindly do stuff the way. And we don't no. think that anyone should really. Mm. I think that maybe the last thing to point out is that this the the the, the flip side of this is obviously that it that we're we're placing a lot of trust and a lot of responsibility on the individuals in the company, right? Yeah. Because you know being in an environment where you're you're encouraged to interact with your players uh, very openly whichever channel you yeah. choose to do that it also means that you have a lot of opportunity to fuck stuff up right of course and i think that's the flip side here uh, you know this this approach to communications it does require that our our employees really take this responsibility seriously and it used to be uh, a couple of years back and i think we're not using it anymore but our, our communications policy used to be literally don't be a dick yeah and don't be a richard i think it is today. don't be a, what? a, a richard. richard don't yeah. be a richard right <laughs> and that's important right yeah. because this you know being able to speak or frankly or, yeah, yeah it, it also gives you a lot of power to to mess things up yeah. and, and i think that is the thing that we as a company would then ask in return of yeah. everyone who works here is really think about what you're saying and really well, yeah. you know really think twice before you get into heated arguments we've had that, that and right? we all yeah yeah absolutely yeah cool yeah and that's that that's that's all i had to say about that that's good you know?
Let's Good. follow and see what happens. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna keep. Hopefully, we'll keep the podcast going throughout the uh, July. Uh, if we've counted the weeks correctly, I think we should be able to do that. So thanks for listening. If you're not already subscribing to us, please do so. We're on Spotify, iTunes. We're on YouTube. Uh, so click that subscribe button wherever you're listening. Leave a comment. Uh, send us an email. Ping us on Twitter. Let us know what you would like us to talk about in the next episode and we will hear uh, you will hear from us in a couple of weeks time thank you thank bye you bye bye